After over a month of going through this sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, we come to a fork in the road. Because our Lord has been telling his people, his disciples, those who were with him, all about the necessary faith in him and the fact that we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Or as it is more properly translated, gnaw on his flesh. The realism of his words was not lost on the Jews around him. They knew exactly what he was saying, that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, and that without that, we have no life. It comes to the point today where they say this saying is hard, who can accept it? And they choose no longer to follow him. They walk away. They leave Christ. And he lets them go because we all have free will. We have all been given that gift from God, hopefully to use it well, but in this case, we see that it was not. He knew exactly what he was telling them over and over, that the Blessed Sacrament of the Eucharist, as the center of our faith, is something that cannot be dispensed with, that it truly is his body and blood and that people must accept him at his word or they have no life. So on this forked road, our Lord goes one way and these many people who were simply worried about their empty bellies, went another. If this wasn't enough, it's not the only controversy in the readings we have today. This first one of the Blessed Sacrament is tied closely to two others. The first is with Judas. It says, Some of you do not believe, because Jesus knew the one who would betray him. At this very moment, when our Lord is telling everyone about the Eucharistic mystery, about the necessity of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, the first crack in the heart of Judas's priesthood is seen. And there's a tear in the early church that one among the eleven at this moment began his path to destruction, began his path which would end in betrayal and suicide. He turned over our Lord to the Romans. We see this similarly today, that amidst the church, there is much controversy, even when there need not be. The people are constantly turning toward their own opinions instead of the actual truth that Christ has revealed, not allowing the church to be the authority that we need, but a hindrance and a burden to our self-expression or what other nonsense we might have. And yet there's a third controversy. Wives, be subordinate to your husbands. This line by itself might be controversial, but in the context of this whole, we realize it's simply part and parcel of our faith, and that Paul is not denigrating women. He knows that God created man and woman equal in dignity, that their worth is completely the same before God. What he is saying here in context is that marriage is a symbol of Christ and his church. But if we do not understand the Eucharist and we don't understand the church, we'll never understand this mystery of marriage. And this is why we're having such trouble even in the church today. When people are disputing the truth of the Eucharist, saying that anyone can come and receive it without proper dispositions, rather than coming to confession, getting rid of our sins so that we can truly receive our Lord worthily, saying that people don't need to truly believe everything that the church teaches, that anyone can come, Rather than saying, to receive communion, we must be in communion. In our hearts, minds, soul, and body. In everything that we say, think, and do, it must be aligned with the church. But then if people do not understand the church, why bother with that? If we do not see her truly as our nourishing mother, as the bride of Christ, and therefore Christ himself, then we wouldn't accept this either. But if we see the church truly as his bride, as his body. We recognize that obeying the church means obeying Christ, obeying God himself. But not much of this is accepted today, and so marriage itself is thrown out, as well as the other sacraments. But what uh, what St. Paul says here is that he is speaking in reference to Christ and the church, meaning that none of this makes sense if we do not look to Christ first. If we look to him, we must then look to the cross. Because it's on the cross that he gave his body and his flesh for the life of the world. It's on the cross that he poured out from his wounded side the church, his bride, his body. 
And it's from the cross that we understand what marriage is. The mutual love between one man and one woman as God created them. To express to the world the love that Christ has for every single one of us. There's a great beauty here. There's something joyful and loving. But what the world sees is simply oppression and a whole bunch of other lies that we hear all throughout the media. None of this is any different than it was 2,000 years ago. Not only in the media, not only in the world, but in the church, we hear these same murmurings, these same debacles, saying this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? About the Eucharist, about proper disposition, about the church actually being in charge of us, about her knowing everything that we need to do, about marriage and all its truths, that it's for the exclusive union between one man and woman for the procreation and education of children. All of these truths are part of our faith, but they are hard sayings because we're raised in a world that does not accept them and in fact does everything it can to go against them. And so as we come here on this Sunday morning, we are asked the same question that the apostles were. As we are at this crossroads, at this fork in the road, as we hear these hard sayings, our Lord says, do you also want to leave? Do you want to go to those things that are out there that are easier but worthless? Put another way, I think our Lord asks us every time we come to these hard sayings, will you stay with me? No matter what's going on in the world, no matter how many bishops and priests are arguing about things online, will you stay with me? Because it's only Jesus that makes all of this make sense. It's only God that makes it all worth it. And as soon as we take him out of the equation, we might as well give up. Because there is no hope without him. But here today he asks us, will you stay with me? Even with these hard sayings and teachings. Even with those difficulties. Because as St. Peter says, with him is eternal life. With him is the joy and the fulfillment of every desire that we have in our hearts the desire that the world tries to fulfill in every way except the one true way. So we find ourselves then on that fork road, perhaps to go with the very few that follow our Lord on the right path, or to go with the many, many who will go on the left path, the one that leads to destruction. I hope for all of our sake that today with Joshua in the first reading, we can all say individually and as a parish, that by the grace of God, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord.